My name is John Cues, and I'm an alcoholic and heroin addict. Um, I identify myself as an alcoholic out of respect for the fellowship where I found my recovery. I'm here today to tell you my story. Um, my sobriety date is April 20th of 2012. That means I will be coming up on four years sober um, this coming April. Um, like I said, I am a heroin addict. Um, that was my drug of choice and I used that drug for over 11 years. Um, I came from a normal family growing up. Um, I have two older sisters who were very successful in life as well as a younger brother. Um, none of them have this disease the way that I do. Um, my mom was there for me growing up. Uh, my mother and father separated when I was a young child but I suffered from signs of this disease even as a small kid. Um, I remember lying as a young child. Um, I ate compulsively um, and I craved the need for power and control. Um, going through school, I was a good student. Um, graduated third in my class. Um, I played sports. I worked a job. Um, on the weekends, I drank. When I was at the age of 15, I had a heart attack, and that changed my out like, outlook on life forever. Um, my first consequences that I suffered from my drinking and using were my sophomore year in high school. We proceeded to drink and thought it was a good idea on the school bus on the way to our football game. Um, we got caught, and I never went back to playing football. Um, when I stopped playing football is when my addiction took off. Um, I got out of school. I would smoke pot and drink on a daily basis. Um, I would still manage to do my schoolwork somehow, but, you know, it was no longer a focal point of my life. Um, I graduated high school in June of 2001 with intentions of going to Northern Kentucky University to be a math teacher and a football coach. Um, little did I know that that wasn't the path that I was gonna go down. Um, shortly after graduation, I started drinking and smoking pot and taking pills on a daily basis. Um, by August of that year, I had been arrested for the first time on four felonies and four misdemeanor charges. Um, and actually the day I got out of jail was the first day that I ever used heroin. Um, I spe specifically remember that day. Um, I was hanging out with some guys I knew since I was a little kid and they were using heroin and shooting it up in the bathroom. And I went in and they shot me up. And I remember walking out of the bathroom and falling to the floor and they drug me to the couch and I remember saying to myself that I was going to do this every day for the rest of my life. It quieted all things in my head. Um, in that time since then, I've been to eight long-term treatment centers. I've been to a local detox center over 13 times. I have been in prison for almost five years of my life off and on and I've been on some type of adult supervision since the age of 18. My using took me to depths that I thought that I would never go. Um, you know, I stole from my family things that can never re be replaced. I remember specifically stealing my mom's wedding ring and taking it to the pawn shop and then helping her look for it for the next three days. And on the third day, I was dope sick again. So I told her where her ring was so that she could go get it. And she went and got it out of the pawn shop and brought it back to the house. And within an hour, I had it back at the pawn shop so that I could go get high. Stolen priceless heirlooms from my grandfather, um, my dad, my brothers and my sisters, my grandma. Um, you know, my... I was homeless in countless succession times. Sleeping behind Kroger's was perfectly acceptable to me. 
Um, the only thing that I cared about was getting high. At one point in time, I had a $1,200 to a $1,500 a day heroin habit. I have sold cars, I've stolen from stores, I've done unspeakable things to obtain my drugs. A normal day for me was getting up and robbing someone, getting shot at, waiting in my car for hours on end for my drug dealer to show up. My sole focus was on me and what I wanted, and what I wanted was to get high. There were times that I was admitted to the hospital for a staph infection in my arm. Uh, they had to operate because they didn't know if they were gonna be able to keep my arm or not because the infection was so bad. When I was in the hospital, um, I left and went and copped heroin. And I came back and I overdosed in my hospital bed. I got placed in Kenton County Drug Court um, after my last felony charges. Um, and that changed my life forever. I was in treatment through drug court for about 60 days. And I was lying and I was stealing and I wasn't doing the program of recovery that they suggested to me. And I got caught. And I ran. And um, my last 30 days of using, it was a Friday that I had left treatment and I had sold the car that my sister had bought me. And I went and bought needles. And I remember my drug court counselor specifically calling me and said that he had knew that I had left treatment and I told him, yes, I had, and I was going to get high. And then I would turn myself in when I was ready. And I only made it 30 days. The day that I ran from treatment, I overdosed and died in the hotel that I was held up in that night. I got up the next morning once I was brought back and overdosed again that next morning and continued to use for the last 28 days. Um, in that time I was on the streets, homeless, didn't have a car. All I carried with me was a backpack with two white t-shirts um, so that I had something to wear that I, when I went to jail and a box of needles and I was perfectly all right living that life because that's all that I knew. 28 days went by and life was pure hell. There were points in times during my use that I remember going into the side door of my bathroom in my apartment and opening the vanity because I couldn't stand to see the person that I had become. I couldn't look in a mirror. Nobody wanted me around and it got to a point that even the people that I used with didn't want me around unless I had something to offer them. I had no friends. My family still loved me, but they were unwilling to, to give me anymore because I had taken so much from them. On April 19th of 2012, reality finally set in. I was just done and I, I didn't know what it was, but I know I didn't want to be the person that I was anymore. So I went back to jail where I was very comfortable and I turned myself in. I remember sitting in booking in the Kenton County Detention Center and crying my eyes out to the pretrial person because I couldn't understand why I, why I couldn't get better. I couldn't understand why I kept doing the things that I was doing. And I really didn't believe that treatment would work. I really didn't believe that any 12-step fellowships would work. I really didn't believe that God was the answer. And I really did believe that this was just how I was going to live my life, the rest of my life. And I turned myself into jail and they gave me one more opportunity to go back to a treatment center that I had been to four times already. And when I got there, something had already begun to change in me and I didn't really know what it was. I specifically remember 
my first two weeks in the treatment center and all I did was cry and I couldn't explain why. I felt lonely and empty inside and to be honest with you, I didn't know if I wanted to live or die. But my first day back at that treatment center, a gentleman, my best friend today, showed up and it was a guy that I had used with for about eight years. And my last day using, um, he was using with me and we were held up in a local hotel, not eating, doing whatever we could to get high, and that's just how we lived our life. And when I ran from that treatment center, he was there, and he stayed and completed the program, and he had started doing a 12-step fellowship. And my first day back at that treatment center, he had heard that I was back, and he came to see me. When he came around that corner, I could tell there was something visibly different about this man and he came up and he gave me a hug and told me that he was glad I was alive and we sat down and talked for a little bit and in that conversation I asked him what was different because I could see the difference and he had told me that he does the 12-step fellowship and he has a sponsor and God's got him to where he is today and for the first time in my life I had met somebody that was as bad off as I was, that was sober and living a life that I didn't even know was possible. So at that treatment center, I did what I was asked of me. And, and things started to change. I got a sponsor through my 12-step fellowship and started doing what was suggested of me. I started hitting my knees every morning and every night and I was praying and I don't know who or what I was praying to, but that's what was told of me to do. And I didn't know what I believed or what I didn't believe, but I believe that I finally realized that my way of doing things wasn't going to work. You know, I remember being in that treatment center and, and calling my sponsor every morning and saying, Nick, I don't, I don't know what to wear today, man. I, I was so afraid to make a choice, I didn't even know what clothes to put on. And he'd say, look around, and what everybody else is putting on, you go put on too. And I said, but I want to be sober. And he said, and maybe they do too, so just do what they say. So I started doing those things. And I did the work that was put in front of me. You know, I remember being at that treatment center and being there before and all I wanted to be was house president and I wanted the wow, look at me feature. And this time I didn't. Um, and I actually got voted house president and I told him I declined the nomination because I was in no position to help anybody else. You know, I remember graduating that treatment center sitting in the same room that my parents had sat in four other times and hearing them speak those four other times saying, you know, thank you for giving my, me my old John back. And I remember that scaring the life out of me because the old John was the person that hurt everybody, including himself. And I remember sitting there that graduation night and my mom standing up and saying, Thank you for giving me the John that I always knew I could have. After 90 short days, things had already changed in my life so dramatically that it was already a life that I didn't know. I got out of that treatment center and I was scared to death. I went to live in a sober living house and that was something new for me. I got a job and I remember working my butt off for two straight weeks to get a paycheck to pay my bills and have 40 bucks left to last me the next two weeks. And somehow I made it through those two weeks without having to use or rob and steal from somebody. 
I developed friends that cared about me, not about what I had. People taught me how to be a son, how to be a brother, how to be a nephew and an uncle to my two little nieces and nephews. They taught me how to go to work, to do what was asked of me, and that it was all right not to know the answer. In the almost four years that I've been sober, things have happened that I don't believe would have happened in my life if I wouldn't have been to where I was. My first Christmas sober, my sister didn't want me in her home because she couldn't trust me. She didn't want to allow me back into her life because she believed that it was going to be the same thing over and over again. That John would do well for a short period of time to return to the person that he was. And I understood that for the first time. Their fear was directly created because of my actions. And I understood that. A few short months later, my sister took the family on a vacation and I was asked to go. Within itself was mind blowing. I had been on vacation, when we got, I was sober exactly a year. We left the day after my year anniversary of being sober to go on vacation. And we went to Florida. And I remember our first night in Florida, standing at the ocean. It's my six-year-old little nephew standing in front of me, petrified of the water from the year before. And he allowed me to pick him up and walk out into the water. and knew that he would be safe in my arms. And I can't describe the feeling that I get when I think about that. That my life had changed so much that not only an innocent child trusted me, but my sister who I had hurt so bad trusted me with her child in my arms. God is so ever prevalent in my life, and I say that without knowing what God is. But it's the only explanation I can have for where I'm at today. My journey on recovery hasn't been an easy one. The same problems that life presented to me when I was using are still being presented to me today but I deal with them. I don't run from them. I don't try to hide them. And I don't try to block them out of my mind. Today where I'm at, I am a father to a 21 month old son who's never had to see his daddy high. He's never had to go to bed at night without his dad being there. I have a, a 10 month old daughter who loves her dad so much. I just bought a house in September and my mom believes in me so much she made a 30 year commitment by co-signing on my home. I have keys to her house and the garage codes to both of my sister's homes. The homes that I wasn't even allowed in when they were there. Where I was for 11 years of my life
the loneliness and despair that I felt, the hurt that I caused my family, have all but been repaired in the last four years of my life. I caught my first felony charges at the age of 18. I sit here today, 33 years old, a free man for the first time in my adult life. In October, I graduated the Kenton County Drug Court Program, and I'm internally grateful for those people, for the discipline, for the understanding and the compassion for the love that they had for me, to give me one more opportunity to be the person that I am today. Without the 12 Step Fellowship, I would probably be dead. Without the grace of a loving God, who knows where I would be today. I can't put words on the life that I lived. I can't put a place to where I've been. But what I can tell you is where I am at today is a place that I never dreamed of being possible. When people used to say to me, I want you to live life. I didn't know what they wanted me to live. I didn't know what life was. My drug addiction and my alcoholism have honestly made me the person that I am today. They have given me an outlook on life where I know that everything's gonna be all right, provided that I just do the next right thing that's in front of me. So much so that my faith that I have in this program that they've given me is a solution for every problem that I face today. I have had the privilege of watching this epidemic go from being confined to Republic Street and Ray Street and Vine Street and Sycamore Street in a 10 block radius to everywhere that I look today. It doesn't matter if I sit in a gas station parking lot or go into a Kroger store. I see this disease, I see this drug all around me. You know, I've learned lessons in recovery that I never would have learned without it. I had been sober about two years and that same guy that brought the message to me and gave me hope, who was my best friend, I watched him relapse and run from everything that he had built. I got to feel the hurt, just a fraction of the hurt that I had caused my family. Because even though I loved my friend, it couldn't bear the love that my family had put through me. And the pain that I felt while he was out there using in 30 short days, I can't imagine dragging my family through that for 11 years. I've cried, I've laughed, I've watched people very close to me pass as a, desire this, as a result of this disease. I've watched countless, countless lives get thrown away in prison as a result of this disease. And then I get to sit and look at what my life is today as a result of this disease.
and it's amazing. I've had the same courts that told me that I should spend the rest of my life in prison, grant me custody of my two children until their mother got a little better. I've had those same courts grant me guardianship of my father who who's dying of this disease so that he could get better. I've had a privilege of doing an internship at the treatment center that I went to and get to help those guys by telling them my story and letting them know that recovery is possible, that you can have a family again, that you can be a son and a brother and a father. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of surrender. And more importantly, it takes a whole lot of humility to say, I don't know what's best for me. When I graduated drug court on October 1st of this past year, I remember standing in front of that and the judge asked me how long I had been in the program and I had told him four years. And he said to me, that's as long as a college education. And then standing in front of that crowd of people next to that judge holding that certificate, my response was, this certificate of completion means more to me than any college education and has probably cost my family more than any college education ever will. And I remember that morning as I knew that I'd have to speak in front of those people trying to figure out what I was going to say because words can't describe where I was and where I'm at today. Now I remember sitting in jail for all those years and in treatment centers for all those years and receiving letters and cards from my mom and my grandmother and my sisters. And I remember visits that were 256 miles away one way and every other weekend my family would come in hopes that I would get better. And I was just thinking about all those things. My mom showed up at my new home and she handed me a letter. And then she left and gave me a kiss and told me that she'd see me at graduation and she loved me. And as she got in her car and she drove off, I read the letter that she wrote. And the letter that she wrote was exactly what I needed to say to those people at that graduation. And I needed to say that because they weren't my words. Because I can tell you who I was and who I am today. But the most powerful thing is when the people that have known you your entire life and who you were and who you are today tell you who you are today. That letter that my mom wrote me, I'd like to read. And it says, My dearest John, as I begin to write this letter today, memories come rushing back of the days and years gone by that I wrote to you, but from a totally different place in our lives. I was writing to you in rehab after rehab, jail cell after jail cell and in hopeless and desperation for a life I only prayed you would someday have. Finally, after 14 years, we are there. I can't begin to tell you how proud I am of the man you are today. You are the strongest man I know. I have witnessed the pitiful, sad, skinny, and helpless person you were when you were using. And I have also witnessed the struggle and strength and faith of a man fighting his way to sobriety. And we watched it over and over and over again for all of your adult life. You have taught me more about life through your suffering in times of pure desperation than I learned 
any other way. You were my inspiration many, many days. And today is one of those days. The journey I have taken with you <laughs> has brought a lot of tears and gut-wrenching sadness and emptiness. But it has also brought a lot of joy, understanding, and knowledge. That it has helped us grow to be the people we are today. It sounds odd, I know. But I am a better person because of your addiction and recovery. And for that, I will always be grateful for you. Going to classes before visitation every Sunday at Drogi House has taught me acceptance and understanding of addiction, while visits in jail taught me humility. Grateful Life Center taught me gratitude for another chance for you to get clean, but drug court was the best teacher of all for me. It taught me that discipline and obedience and rules and regulations and no more excuses was the way to go with you if I ever wanted to see you live through this. And Judge Bartlett and Adam will always have my undying respect and gratitude for giving you back to me better than you were before it all began. I never gave up on you, John. I always knew deep down that you could succeed in recovery and that your life would be a gift to many who suffer like you did. You have a kind heart and a compassion like no other for people who need and hope need hope and help but most of all faith yours has made me even stronger and again i thank you you have so many people who love you and respect you for all you have been through and all you have accomplished and you have learned all of it the hard way but your family your sisters your brother your grandma and most of all me love you more than you will ever know you have been special to me since you were before you were ever born. And you always be my baby. And one of my greatest blessings, I am so proud that, that you are my son. I love you, Mom. To go from where I was to this letter right here is proof that recovery from this disease is possible. And when I sit and think about the times that I felt that everybody had given up on me, that I had given up on me, that God had given up on me, and that this was the life that I was going to live, to knowing that through all of it, Every person that I thought it gave up on me was still there. And it loved me just as much then as they do today. But they had to do what they had to do, which was let me travel my own path and love me from a distance, whether it was pressing charges on me from stealing from them, whether it was driving me to jail or taking me to another treatment center or letting me back in their home so that I could rob them just one more time. To know that they wouldn't trade any of that to have who I am today is just amazing. I got a text from my mom the other day saying that I'd do it all again. And I can't say that I would. To know that I can live a life of recovery and to be a father to my two little babies, to get to get off of work and to come to a home that I can call my own to see my fiance, who I love very much, and to open the door. And the first thing that I hear is daddy. And my little boy, the look on his face when I come through that door. And to feel his arms wrapped around me and him tell me that I love, he loves me. That's more powerful than that drug could ever gave me.
life is still not easy. It still doesn't go perfect. And there's a lot of days I end up doing things that I don't want to do. But I can tell you this. I've made wrong choices in recovery. I've hurt people in recovery. But the two things that I've done in almost the four years that I've been sober is every night when I go to bed, I hit my knees. I thank God for another day. I ask Him for guidance and direction and strength to follow the path that He sets forth in front of me. I ask for Him to keep my faith in Him to show me who He wants me to be and show me where I'm of most use. And most importantly, no matter how bad it gets, as long as I remember that as long as I just don't use today, I have a shot at a different tomorrow. For those two things, I'm eternally grateful. And I'll never stop doing them. Because I know that if I do, I'll be right back where I was. And that I may not be granted another opportunity to get back to where I am today. I know from personal experience that recovery is possible. That you can be in the depths of hell and that you can get back up. I always used to think that people like me didn't have a bottom. And I had heard my whole life that you had to reach a bottom to climb back out. Until about a year ago, I heard from somebody who had been sober for 32 years. And what he said to me, it all kind of made sense. If you would have asked me what happened that last day that I used, for me to want to change my life, for me to want to surrender, for, want to, for me to want to find humility within myself and within God, I would have told you I couldn't put a finger on it and I wouldn't have known what it was. And that day that gentleman told me, he said, everybody's bottom is when they can't stand to be the person that they are anymore. It doesn't have to be jail. It doesn't have to be homelessness. It doesn't have to be an overdose. It doesn't have to be standing there all by yourself. But when in your own heart, you know that you don't want to be that person anymore. And how do you know that you found that bottom? You start to do something to change. You put forth the effort, no matter what that it is, to not be that person anymore. And it has to start with not using. It has to be with putting a belief and a faith in something other than yourself. Whether it be the treatment program that you're in, whether it be a 12-step fellowship that you're involved in, or whether it may just be a wonder why you're still alive today. Because the reason why I'm still alive today is a result of my God. I hope for everyone that suffers from this disease that they can find what I have today. But I know in reality, not everybody's going to find it. I hope that my story gives just one person strength, gives one person a belief that they can keep fighting and they too can have what I have today. And if that's possible, then everything that I, that my family, that my community has gone through as a result of my drug addiction, it's all worth it if just one person can find a life that I have today. So I thank God, the 12-step fellowship that I'm in, the criminal justice system, 
the people in the treatment centers, my family, my kids, and most of all, God, for standing by me and placing me right where they need me to be. Life is a beautiful thing. You just have to want it.